Okay, let's start. Welcome everybody. Welcome back to those that were attending uh, the first meeting two weeks ago and uh, welcome to all those that decided to join now. To those people, I will tell immediately, you can always look back at uh, the recording of that meeting on the, this YouTube channel. So just for who uh, is here for the first time, my name is Federico Savini. I'm Associate Professor of Environmental Planning at the University of Amsterdam. And I'm here co-organizing this mini series with Leo van Kampenhout here uh, with us and uh, with Fabian de Blander, which is not with us today, is having an action in The Hague, actually. So with Scientist Rebellion, and uh, we support him, I would say. Um, so today is the second of a, a meeting of uh, a series of four meetings on degrowth, organized by the Future Scientist webinar series. And um, um, the first meeting, we introduced the term degrowth. Uh, we had a lecture by Kredis Rammelt from the University of Amsterdam, who introduced us to the term and to the reason why it makes sense to think in terms of degrowth instead of green growth. Today, we will go dive deeper in the, um, in the thinking around degrowth and talk about perspectives and strategies and different ways to look at this term in, uh, uh, in, in its use in society. Um, the third of meeting will dive even deeper on the concrete policy measures that fit a degrow agenda that will be in two weeks. So follow the news on the website, please. And the fourth meeting, which is the last, will have a panel discussion with three experts on degrowth here in the Netherlands. And there we will talk about concrete degrowth strategies and implications of degrowth for the Netherlands. So please come to that meeting as well. Today, um, we uh, have uh, uh, our guest of today is uh, Miriam Meisner. She's a assistant professor in culture and political ecology at the University of Maastricht. And uh, um, she's also, like Kredis Rammert, also a member of the Hontgroei uh, Association, the Dutch Degrowth Association. If you didn't do so before, I invite you to check the website of the Hontgroei Association in the Netherlands. And uh, uh, as last time, we'll have a lecture of uh, half an hour followed by questions. About that, just before to start, uh, just like, like the last time, you can add your questions uh, through clicking it, uh, to the Mentimeter link, which is placed in the chat of YouTube of the uh, video that you're watching. By, by clicking on that link, you will be uh, brought into Mentimeter. We will collect the questions. And with the help of Leo, I will post the questions that you have uh, written there. So um, I welcome Miriam Mesner and uh, I give her the floor right away. Okay, well, thanks so much for the introduction. And uh, well, I would very much like to thank scientists for future and also of course, Andrui for organizing this uh, webinar series and for the invitation. I'm quite happy to be there and I go right away into my presentation. And for that, I, I think I need to share my slides. I hope you can see them now. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thanks for confirming. Um, so today I want to talk about well-being and degrowth. And to do that, I should first briefly say what I mean when I say degrowth. So what's degrowth? Then for me, um, I would describe degrowth as three things. I would say it's first of all a critique to three key beliefs that are implicit in the green growth paradigm, and I'll get to those in a bit. And this critique is based on empirical research, but it's also based very importantly on social justice and ethical considerations. The second is degrowth is a proposal for an alternative social order. And when I say social order, then I also very much mean, well, I mean economic system, but I also mean democracy, cultural values and lifestyles, and also the ways in which humans relate to ecology. And then finally, degrowth is also what I think is the beginning of a movement or community of practice. And I hope to get into that a little bit at the, big, at the end of this lecture. Now I've said that degrowth is a critique to three key beliefs 
that are yeah implicit in green growth. But what are those beliefs? Now, green growth is a sustainability paradigm that is characterized by three, I think, underlying beliefs, some of which are explicit and some of which are a bit more implicit. And I think that the first implicit belief of green growth or the green growth paradigm is that economic growth is good for society and that it's therefore worth pursuing economic growth as a central policy goal. The second very important and maybe more explicit core belief of green growth is that economic growth can be uncoupled from its negative environmental impacts, such as resource use, emissions and pollution. And equally important, of course, that this can be done at the speed and scale that is required in order to effectively halt environmental breakdown, which has already started. And then I think the third belief, which is a little bit more optional, perhaps, in the green growth paradigm, but that's the belief that economic growth is a motor uh, of environmental sustainability, for instance, by driving the innovation of green technologies. Now, my fellow degrowth advocate, Kreles Ramet, has shown two weeks ago, quite convincingly, I find, why I believe number two is a false belief. Uh, and the evidence for that is, I think, mounting. If you'd like me to direct you towards some recent scientific reports that come to the same conclusion, I'd be very happy to do that in the end of this talk. But today I would like to focus in particular on green growth beliefs number one and number three. And uh, after that, I'd like to talk about degrowth as a proposal for an alternative social order and key principles of that proposal. Now let's start then maybe with belief number one, which is the belief that growth is good for society. So we can see this belief reflected, for example, in this publication of the European Commission, which celebrates the fact that economic output in Europe is back to pre-pandemic levels and projected to grow in the future. As the public publication states, spring brought a positive growth surprise. So what actually is then economic growth? Economic growth is usually measured in GDP of gross domestic product. And that's a statistical figure which counts the monetary value of all final goods and services that are produced in an economy, for instance, the economy of the Netherlands over a certain period of time, usually a year. And why is it supposedly good to have this figure grow year by year again and again? Now, the underlying idea is that a rising GDP equals a rise in employment and therefore also income, that it means more prosperity and therefore also less poverty, and that it leads to more happiness. Importantly, it's also assumed that more GDP leads to more tax for the stage, for the state, <laughs> which can then be spent on education, on healthcare, infrastructures, and other forms of social welfare. And then finally, a high GDP is also associated with a certain geopower or military power, although this correlation isn't always evident. Now, what do degrowthers then say about this first belief that growth is good, that growth is good for our social well-being or our common well-being? Now, the first critique would be that a growing pie doesn't necessarily guarantee a fair distribution. So yes, economies might increase the volume of their goods and services produced each year, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone gets to enjoy the benefits of this. And we all know that inequality is right now an issue. For example, the richest 10% of the world population currently own 76% of the global wealth. In contrast, the bottom 50% only own, sorry, 2%. So that's, I think, some figures that we might reflect on for a short moment of time. Now, we might think that in the Netherlands, the situation is much better, that the equality is much higher. But even there, the richest 10% hold 61% of the collective wealth. All of this gets even more extreme if we look at the super rich. It's 1% of the global population that holds almost half of the world's total wealth. That's not just a bit of inequality, that's massive. And this inequality is also reflected in carbon footprints. 
as this study of Oxfam recently showed, 50% of the world's carbon emissions are produced by the world richest 10%. The poorest 50% in contrast are responsible for a mere 10%. And this then also, I think, tells us something about who in particular has to rethink their lifestyle in order for us to reach urgent climate and also other eco targets. Now, skeptics might, of course, say that inequality is something that happens mainly at the global scale as a difference between North and South, for example. But that's not so much that it's not so much an issue, for instance, within rich nations of early industrialization. Now here is such a nation, the US, and as we can see in the first graph on the left, the US has experienced more or less steady increase in GDP throughout the past 50 years. And in the same period, however, and that's what we can see here in the graph on the right, the gap between rich and poor has rather increased. Now again, skeptics might argue that inequality is not the same as poverty, and that while the rich became it might nonetheless be that poverty rates also improved with the rising GDP. But again, as you can see here in the yellow circle, the percentage of people that are in poverty in the US did not really diminish in that period either. So all of this goes to show that the equation between GDP and collective material wealth does not really hold. But what about the idea that high GDP equals collective well-being and happiness? Now here, degrowthers or degrowth advocates would say that GDP is a highly inaccurate, if not to say useless indicator. The first thing to consider in this context is that GDP doesn't say anything about the quality of the goods and services produced in an economy. It only says something about the quantity of the monetary value of those goods and services. So to re-evoke the metaphor of the cake one more time, the ideology of GDP growth is if the cake is big, then it must be good, right? Well, I think some of us might have tasted already a cake that was big and nonetheless not so good. And here are some examples of things that positively contribute to GDP. Having to hire a company in order to clean up an oil spill, producing munition for a war, or producing objects like this pink plastic sculpture of a bullfight, which some people might like if they're into plastic and animal abuse, but it's probably not central to our happiness. Now, I'm not saying that the action of cleaning up an oil spill is of course wrong. It's not a bad thing. The cleaning up is good, yet the overall situation that led to that cleanup is not something that most of us would describe as collective well-being. This, however, is what GDP is supposed to measure. In contrast, the following values are completely unaccounted for within our GDP. When I care for my children or a sick relative, then the value I create does not go into GDP. If I hire someone to do that for me, however, then that does count as GDP. If I cook a healthy meal for my family, then this value does not go into GDP. If I order us a pizza, then it does. When I clean my flat, then the value I create won't be reflected in GDP. If I hire a cleaner instead, then it will. When I volunteer to plant trees in a local park, then this doesn't count as GDP if I hire a company to do the job. In contrast, it would count. So overall, any value that we create but do not sell on the market would not go into GDP. And the same, of course, also goes for the values that ecosystems create every day, such as clean air or fresh water. It's not counted. GDP only counts the stuff that is being sold on the market. Now, finally, we might also want to check some attempts that were made in order to empirically examine the relationship between GDP and subjective levels of well-being. So what you can see here is a graph from a recent study that shows how different countries score with respect to average GDP per capita and inhabitants' subjective assessments of well-being, measured here as cognitive life evaluation, effect balance, and momentary affect. And what these studies showed, and in so doing it is confirming previous studies, is that there is no clear-cut relationship between GDP growth and an increase in well-being. The story is more complex than that, 
Now, again, possible criticism of this argument could be that degrowth or degrowth advocates romanticize poverty, poverty as in low GDP. Yet I believe that that is not the point. The point of degrowth thinking is to de-romanticize or de-fetishize GDP as a total, whether it's high or low. Because the story is more complex, Steve Groth does advocate finding better drivers and more accurate measures of well-being, measures that must also take into account the ecological foundations of our well-being and of our livelihoods. Okay, so all of that is to debunk the belief that growth is good. And I hope I can convince you that this is not necessarily the case. Um, but there was also this third belief that growth might be needed in order for promoting sustainability. And um, well, the underlying belief of that idea is of course that innovation needs competition for patents and profit. The idea is that it needs companies and private entrepreneurs to take risks and compete with each other in order for something new to emerge. Think for instance of competition for vaccine patents in the context of the COVID pandemic. But again, there, research shows that it's not necessarily the case. Innovation may result from competition for profit, yes. Yet quite often it also results from state investments into research or from community groups and from activism. The economist Mariana Mazzucato has shown, for example, that every technology that makes the iPhone so smart was initially government funded the internet, GPS, its touchscreen display, and the voice activated Siri, for example. Again, critics would say, but how to invest these state investments if we don't have GDP growth? The state needs GDP in order to have tax revenues and then it can invest, right? And here one, I think initially good answer would be through redistribution. How about we start, for example, by investing those 5.9 billion, 6.8% of the global GDP that are currently invested in global fossil fuel subsidies into cooperative research and maybe also into ecological regeneration if we're already starting, such as rewilding, tree planting, cleaning up pollution, and so on. That would be a good start. And then the second critique that degrowthers would put forth in relation to the belief that it needs growth for sustainable innovation is that we need to urgently expand our imaginary of what it means to innovate. Because there isn't just technological innovation, there's also such a thing as social and cultural innovation. So yes, degrowthers might be pessimistic about relying solely or alone on technofixes to the climate and biodiversity crisis. That's why they are often accused of pessimism, yet they are actually quite optimistic about combining technological with social innovation. And this finally brings me from the critique to the more constructive part, namely to degrowth proposals for an alternative social order. Now, uh, degrowth research and the degrowth community have put forth a whole arsenal of different suggestions that go into various levels of detail. And um, I can't cover them all here. I think that's clear. I would like to focus on five, well, five principles or five principle suggestions that are, in my view, at least key. Um, and if you happen then to want more, which I hope, but then I'd very much recommend those two books. Um, I think one of them was already recommended in the last webinar. And of course, the next session of this webinar series, which will zoom in even more on policy proposals. What I'd like to do instead is to offer, yeah, broader suggestions for policy principles. And uh, the first suggestion, which you might have expected a bit already from the beginning of my talk, would be aim for well-being rather than GDP. So my favorite definition of degrowth would be a society that pursues well-being directly rather than by proxy of GDP. Now that's not the standard definition of degrowth, I should say, but what most degrowth advocates do highlight is that degrowth is not primarily about shrinking GDP. So the final goal of degrowth 
is of course not to provoke a recession. A recession would be what happens if the socioeconomic system stays the same, but GDP goes down. That we know tends to have catastrophic social impacts. That's why the emphasis of degrowth is on different, not only on less, so not only a recession, but a different social order. Yet a decline in GDP is the likely result, especially for sort of rich nations, of this transformation towards something different. So that goes in particular for rich industrialized nations. And uh, well, to do things differently, we first of all need to clarify what well-being means for us. So what makes us well? What is essential and what would be a nice extra to have perhaps? So here are some examples of what I think are essential goods and services, things that we absolutely need. First of all, I think we absolutely need an intact ecosystem because it's the precondition of everything else. Um, conservationists also call this ecosystem services and it involves direct so-called provisioning services such as providing food, fresh water and clean air but it also includes regulating services such as pollination or flood prevention and cultural services such as providing space for recreation or just the beauty of nature, which makes at least most of us, I think, quite well. Now, personally, I don't really like the term ecosystem services because I don't think that ecology is just a service from planet to human. And I also think that we are part of ecology. Yet what I do like is considering ecology as an essential factor in human wealth, rather than an externality to our wealth production, which is how mainstream economics currently frames it. Other essential factors that we might wanna mention here that in one way or the other also all relate to that first factor are food and water, health and healthcare, housing and clothing, education and of course social justice which i know is difficult to define but may include something like equal opportunities the absence of exploitation and oppression and a fair distribution of wealth and uh, well apart from such essential goods and services i think that it's not a break with degrowth thinking to also have some extra pleasures here and there which might include some travel especially if it happens within low carbon means of transportation the bombastic party, conviviality is a term that, that is often used in the degrowth community, although that signifies much more. Or even that plastic kitsch you can't live without, because uh, degrowth does, I think, not equal asceticism or austerity, even that's how its critics like to portray it. Rather, it means reducing unneeded material wealth in order to realize or restore lost other forms of well-being and interestingly there also seems to that also seems to be a trend lifestyle culture so my personal research at the moment is on minimalist lifestyles and contemporary popular culture and what these lifestyles share is the idea that a certain less such as less consumption or less distraction by the attention economy will result in a personal more such as more mindfulness more free time less time spent on cleaning objects and so on and so forth. But that is of course that hinges on privilege. There are people who can live as frugal as they like. They still cannot afford to make ends meet. For those people, the advice that they should consume less in order to work less is just cruel optimism, it's simply not an option. That's why Chelsea Fagan writes in The Guardian, the only people who can practice minimalism in any meaningful way are those upon whom it is not enforced by either financial or logistical circumstances. And that brings me to my next suggestion, which is redistribute. Degrowthers call for redistribution for a range of reasons. I start with the most obvious one. When in line with degrowth, we either minimize or abolish environmentally harmful industries such as aviation or the fossil fuel industries, um, then that's likely to result in a loss in jobs and incomes. We need distribution in order to balance out the negative social impacts of that. So how could that be achieved? 
One idea for that that is often mentioned within the degrowth debates would be through work sharing. The principle behind this is simple. Instead of creating jobs for all by having high levels of production, we create jobs by dividing the production that there is among more people, resulting in reduced work hours or a shorter working week, for example. Again, there is a kind of cultural appetite for that at the moment. That's a recent article from The Guardian speaking of the post-COVID anti-work movement and the celebration of idleness. But again, that's of course an issue of privilege, right? While for some reduced work hours will result in a fantastic work-life balance, for others it'll result in harmless homelessness. So redistributing work is not enough. We also need to redistribute wealth. And one great way of doing so, for me really a key part of degrowth, would be the introduction of a universal basic income, or UBI. And characteristic of that income is that it is provided unconditionally um, and that it covers basic needs. And as you can see, the UBI is something that even the World Bank is starting to examine as an object. I'm not saying uh, as an option. I'm not saying that they're advocating it, but at least they're looking into it. Meanwhile, about 71% of Europeans supported the idea in a recent survey. Now, contrary to what critics like to claim, there are also concrete financing proposals on the table for UBI. Proposals that might need further working out, that's possible, but they do already exist. And uh, well, in case of doubts regarding its affordability, we might also wanna briefly revisit how wealth is distributed at the moment. 10% are owning 76% of the global wealth, 1% is owning 50%. Those are numbers I think that are very difficult to process, but to get a tasting and to see which kind of social welfare options this kind of redistribution might offer us, I invite you all to have a look at this website, Wealth Shown to Scale. For me, it was really a revealing experience. Um, and well, a positive side effect of introducing a UBI, universal basic income, would be that it also would provide a livelihood for people who choose to invest most of their time into creating values that are not sold on a market such as care for loved ones, for example, or volunteering or political engagement. And that leads me to my third suggestion out of five, which is value that which brings value, not that which is sold. Of course, I believe that most of us personally value people who volunteer or give care to us, um, but that's not what is meant here. That's not the issue. I'm rather talking here about how social, our social economic and economic system values these kind of things and how policy values it. So what does that mean? It means, for example, that we need to find a way of remunerating values that are realized outside of the markets, such as care, work, and volunteering. Interestingly, that is also tied to feminist demands. Feminist critics have long since pointed out that care labor tends to be either unpaid, as in the case of raising children, for example, or underpaid, as in the case of working as a nurse, for example. And this labor still is, at least predominantly, carried out by women at the moment. So what to do about that? Now, in the case of underpaid labor, the solution must be a pay raise. And in the case of labor that is not for sale, such as care for loved ones or volunteering, there UBI would really be a good, well, start of a solution. A UBI would also mean that part-time work would become an option for everybody. And this in turn would mean that unpaid engagement would no longer be hinging on privilege. Because as it stands, people can only invest a reasonable amount of their time into social, political, or ecological engagement or also cultural engagement if they can afford it uh, to work part-time or not at all. Some of you might disagree with this argument, but I have tried to engage in activism in my spare time, still do, and I find it really hard to make a really meaningful contribution there if you only have evenings and weekends, if at all. And I don't even have children, so uh, I imagine that with people for children, that's even harder. <laughs> 
Um, this is why I personally, for instance, went down with my working time, which luckily I can afford, um, but that's not true for everyone. Not to speak of the fact that in some careers or legal systems, employees cannot even opt for part-time work. Now, given the fact that our society is so keen on measuring everything, I also think that we need alternative ways of measuring that which brings value to our society. And um, one example of that would be, or one example of an initiative that strives for an alternative is the so-called Wellbeing Economy Alliance, involving the governments of Scotland, Iceland, Finland, Wales, and New Zealand, but also a range of organizations, movements, and individuals. And the idea of these initiatives is to have policy, policy strive towards well-being rather than GDP growth. A well-being that involves fairness, healthy ecosystems, citizens' particip participation, institutions that serve the common good, and the fact that everyone has enough to live comfortably, uh, associated here with the concept of dignity. Now, the idea is that we need institutions that serve the common good. And that also relates to my fourth suggestion, namely that we need to build institutions for the common good that don't need growth for their survival. A key building block of contemporary capitalist societies is that of the company. Usually companies make profits that go to private persons, including shareholders, and they reinvest their profits into innovation and growth, also to remain competitive. So they really, in a way, have to do that also in a capitalist um, economy. Um, but what will be an alternative to that? One alternative would be that of building cooperatives, voluntary and autonomous associations of persons who meet their common economic, social, or cultural needs through a jointly owned and democratically controlled enterprise. Unlike companies, and that's really interesting, cooperatives do not have to make a profit, compete, or grow because they're directed towards fulfilling the needs of their members. This is a great example or a great initiative for cooperative housing in Amsterdam, the new means. And uh, the new main isn't just about sharing a house, which is of course also a commons in a way, it's a space, but it's also about co-creating and co-managing other material and immaterial values that are central to the community, such as energy, in this case, solar energy, culture, such as a library that is commonly shared, but also care, such as child, child care. Um, and in so doing, it embraces another, well, concept that I think is very central to degrowth, namely the idea of commoning. Now, commoning doesn't just mean sharing a common value. Um, it means collectively setting up the rules for the co-use and co-maintenance of that value. As a practice, not just as a retail source, the commons or rather commoning is really key to degrowth thinking. And it also brings me to my last suggestion, because there is, of course, a commons that definitely needs a better co-use and co-maintenance. And that's the commons of planetary soils, waters, and atmospheres, including the diverse organisms that these commons host. Um, to give you one example here, the International Energy Agency argues in its report Net Zero by 2050 from last year that if we want to stand any reasonable chance of meeting urgent climate tar targets, then there should be no more new development of oil, gas, or coal. Obviously, that's not happening. On the contrary, here you can see um, scientists rebellion protesting against new plans and permits to drill for gas in the Wadensee. And it also hasn't really happened in the past. Ever since the 1990s, United Nations nations have tried to reduce their fossil fuel consumption through carbon pricing, emissions trading, technological innovation, and a whole range of other measures. To put it mildly, that didn't work. Carbon emissions alone have gone up by more than 60% since then. This is why degrowthers, and that's really my last principle, would argue here, we need to stop relying exclusively on technology efficiency and market mechanisms to reduce our consumption of fossil fuels and our destruction of carbon sinks. 
stakes are really too high. We need to focus on effects and not just on efficiency. And well, one way of doing that would be to combine efficiency with sufficiency. So yes, let's use green technology. After all, degrowth is anything uh, but anti-technology, even though it's sometimes portrayed that way. But let's also really reduce our production and consumption of, in particular, those goods and services that are particularly harmful for the environment, such as the consumption of animal protein, for example, a big, big factor, not just in emissions, but also in land use, car driving, offline, you name it. And uh, well, one means for promoting sufficiency, for example, would be to progressively tax environmentally harmful forms of consumption, such as flying or meat eating. For instance, via frequent flyer levy. The point is to ensure that the occasional engagement in some harmful activity doesn't become the exclusive prerogative of the super rich. Now, another measure for keeping an eye on absolute eco impact and not just efficiency would be to institute absolute caps on resource use and pollution, including emissions, of course. And uh, this is why degrowthers tend to align themselves with initiatives such as, for instance, in Europe, the Resource Cap Coalition, which lobbies for an absolute reduction in resource used through resource allowances that are aligned with ecological necessities, of course, and get progressively lowered year by year. Now, this could be done not just for fossil fuels, but for any non-renewable resource. And importantly, it would need to take into account the ecological debt that rich industrialized nations have incurred throughout centuries of colonial and post-colonial exploitation. Okay, so last part. Uh, I would like to say upfront that from the yeah, point of view of the current political climate, it seems unlikely to get a democratic majority for all of those kinds of measures right away. On the one hand, surveys regularly suggest that citizens across different nations would like their policymakers to prioritize ecological goals in their policies. So there's an appetite for that in general. On the other hand though, growth is very deeply ingrained in our dominant cultures and politics. For example, we're used to talking about personal improvement as personal growth, or to describe a good meeting as productive. Meanwhile, growth promoting practices such as high consumer demand and hard work are wildly, widely celebrated. And the same, of course, goes for policy. We are living in a hegemony of growth, which according to historian Matthias Schmelzer manifests itself in a specific ensemble of societal political and academic discourses, theories, and statistical standards that jointly assert and justify the view that GDP growth is desirable, imperative, and essentially limitless. Now, transforming hegemony is a challenge, and it's a challenge with a deadline. By this, I don't just mean that global emissions need to be halved within the next seven years or so, if not early. I also mean quite literally that there's humans and non-humans dying if not going extinct every day due to global heating and due to pollution, both of which are happening for economic growth. So what to do? I think that the only way to change a harmful existing hegemony is to build a broad movement that not only proposes but pushes for an alternative. And uh, well, degrowth is such an alternative, is an endpoint in that sense. And yet, while degrowth has its advocates and representatives worldwide, I wouldn't really call it a very powerful movement, a movement that can really exert enough pressure for the time being, although that might be coming. Here in the Netherlands, we have the degrowth network on Trouille, of which I'm also part. Uh, and this network is growing, but it's still rather small. And yet I prefer to also think of degrowth, not just as a movement, but as a movement of movements or a coalition of different movements and communities of practice. All of which align in their practices and goals with the degrowth, well, degrowth goal or degrowth agenda. Last year, we as a community of 50 degrowth scholars, artists and activists tried to bring some of those movements together in the context of the eighth international degrowth conference in The Hague. 
and those were our thematic streams. And as you can see, we made a quite, well, active attempt to bring together not only different discourses on environmental justice, but also different movements that are working on that. Um, on pessimistic days, I still think that those efforts are a drop in the ocean, so to speak. In particular, would I consider what degrowth is up against? Trillions are currently invested in climate and wildlife harming subsidies, for example. We're funding our own extinction, so to speak, big time. Meanwhile, industries, sometimes entire governments, are seeking to block, dilute, and delay effective environmental action or policy. That's something which frustrates me personally enormously. What makes me hopeful, however, is that climate action hasn't died, not even after the COVID or in the course of the COVID pandemic, because we're still in, in a way. And also that science policy bodies are starting increasingly to take a stance against growthism. The question that I ask myself frequently, however, is will all of that perhaps be too slow? Are we too slow? Too slow, for example, to avert climate tipping points. And related to that, I'm asking myself how to speed up this urgent transition towards degrowth. What can I do? I'm increasingly convinced, for example, that just writing a convincing article or even teaching on degrowth, if there is space in the curriculum, which there usually isn't, isn't enough, not considering what is at stake and how little time there is left, if at all. And uh, well, I'd be very happy to discuss those questions with you as well as any other comments or questions you might have. For now, I would like to thank you for your patience and I look forward to the debate. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Miriam. Um, there is no clapping function in Zoom after three years of pandemic, they didn't figure out how to put it on, but I'm sure there will be. The clapping if it was possible so <clears throat> i think your lecture makes a very nice bridge actually between the lecture of krelis that uh, gave us the reasons for why in term it's important to think in terms of degrowth and also the coming one which will be more specific on concrete policy tools you actually offered a, a very uh, comprehensive perspective of the pandora box that it's open as soon as we start thinking in terms of degrowth so you addressed uh, redistribution, uh, of course, lifestyle, life choices, well-being, but also the role of uh, 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 jobs and universal basic incomes. And of course, um, interesting new frameworks of uh, shared property like uh, the commons. So in fact, there is a lot there. And uh, I'm sure there will be many questions, but let me just start with one, the first one, which will refer mostly to your last uh, slide. So you're calling for a degrowth movement. And uh, um, there are a lot of movements out there already existing, and some of us are part of those. So how do you envision such a movement? What, what, does it, uh, what are the conditions that need to be put in place to create this movement at the moment, according to your view? <laughs> Yes, it's interesting that you should mention conditions. I mean, I think uh, the conditions are in place, right? We are, we are destroying the foundations of, of our livelihoods. There are already people dying. There are already yeah, non-humans, more than humans, however you want to call it, dying. And there is massive inequality. So there is enough conditions, I would say, um, for there to be a movement that, that sort of puts itself into a place and tries to... Tries change the, the system that is in a way destroying everything and leading to this massive inequality. Um, the question I think is, well, there are a lot of different movements that are maybe in part quite fragmented. So how to bring them together, even though they might have their distinct focus, how to bring them together and allow them to fight what they are fighting for while at the same time aligning their efforts towards something that we might have in common. So I think that's a very practical challenge that I also realize as being part of different um, yeah, well, environmental movements. And um, well, I think another challenge that is really, um, it, yeah, I, I think keeping my mind very often busy and I think also of other environmental activists, organizers is of course how to make those movements then also grow and reach out into those yeah, strata of, of society, of people who are maybe already convinced that something needs to happen, but are not really doing anything about that. And to be honest, 
I, I also don't really have the answer of how to make that work. I think that um, some of the forms of activism that we see emerging at the moment are promising for that or are at least having some impacts. Um, some of them are focused, for instance, on civil disobedience, which is, I think, one interesting tactics among other tactics that can increase a sense of urgency for the issue and therefore bring other people who are already maybe half convinced on board. Um, but there is more work to be done in expanding the repertoires of tactics or sometimes the repertoire is already there, but we're not using it. But I think, yeah, I don't have a final answer to that, but I think um, yeah, it's something that keeps me occupied as well. Thinking yeah. about it. mm. It's very clear. Thank you. Um, there is a question actually is related to that, and I, I would like to pose it directly. One of the listeners on YouTube says, since 1972, basically the year of the Club of Rome, we are talking about this issue of limits to growth. And I wonder, uh, the, the, the listener wonders, uh, why are we collectively sleepwalking since then? So we are aware of this, but somehow this idea of degrowth is, just, is becoming popular just now, a bit more recently. So why do you think this is the case now and why it didn't happen before? Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting question and also something that I've wondered many times. And it's indeed this year's the 50th anniversary of the, the report of the Club of Rome. So it's even an extra reason to think about that. Um, I think there are several things to think about there. First of all, I think in the 1970s, the Club of Rome was very much focused in particular on resource use. So even though I think there was emerging research that showed already that climate change is happening, I think it was not as widely um, known and um, substantiated by research as it became um, later on, in particular in the 90s. So I think in the, the early 90s, the first report by the IPCC came out. And I think there, another reason basically to look for a degrowth agenda came up um, on the agenda. But that's of course also already 30 years ago, right? And since then we might have had some time to revive the, the, the degrowth um, idea. And um, why hasn't it happened? I think there's a few points. Um, I think, first of all, I think powerful groups that have an interest in not, not making it um, come to the fore. So there are definitely um, privileged social groups that are currently, well, taking advantage from the socioeconomic system as it stands and are defending their own privileges within that and are trying well, to water down anything that speaks against it. That's also how a lot of climate denialism, of course, took place and was actively funded. So I think that's one thing. And the other thing is, of course, that yeah, system change is a hard thing to wrap your mind around, right? Even to imagine an alternative is such a hard thing. And often, if you start talking about degrowth, you often, I mean, I often confront limits in, in triggering people's imagination because it's such a different thing to imagine you know imagining a different system is really yeah it's something challenging right it's you can imagine a lot of changes that are happening within the system that we're currently living in but degrowth would probably mean that this system as it is happening at the moment doesn't really function in the same way anymore that doesn't mean that the next thing or a zero thing would be worse or anything it just means that it would be very different and it has so many different dimensions that holding that mentally together I think is also a very hard thing and it's a hard thing to lobby for then it's easier to lobby for one little thing within the system so I think that also has something to do with it that would be my my analysis so far yeah yeah, this leads me to other two questions, actually, that I think uh, are relevant for this discussion. The first, uh, it's about uh, pension funds and jobs and revenues. So one of the reasons why we are, we, I mean, politicians hardly embrace this idea is that uh, if we embrace it completely, we will lose a lot of, indeed, the public revenue, revenues, but also all kind of institutions that make society function at the moment and keep social cohesion would collapse like pension funds. So uh, uh, what would be the answer from a degrowth perspective to that question? Yes, I think the I mean the key key answer to that question is the redistribution, right? I don't think for the time being we have a big problem in financing 
um, things such as a pension fund or even social welfare if we take it from the rich um, who are currently uh, yeah, holding 76% of the, of the global wealth. Of course, that's on a global scale and it might be difficult to redistribute on a global scale, although that is needed as well for, for um, sort of yeah, global environmental justice reasons. But even as you saw with the example of the Netherlands, there's also already so much injustice in terms of wealth distribution that there is a big potential to tap into and redistribute and finance those things. Now that's one part of the thing. And the other is that, um, well, certain, uh, yeah, certain of those essential services that, that need to be provided, such as care work, for example, um, could also emerge through a degrowth agenda because it would free up our time, for example, for instance, in order to engage in those kind of things. So that's, I think, also one of one of the, the dimensions to consider there. Mm, I should maybe mention, although that, that goes into a certain level of complexity, there's also a bit of insecurity within the degrowth community as to how many incomes will be lost because um, part of what is um, forecasted is that if we shift um, to a world where we, we rely less heavily on fossil fuels as a source of energy, then we might need more energy from yeah, human bodies and therefore calories, which might create, again, new jobs. So this sort of idea of going down with work is something that we cannot completely project. There will probably be some, some form of work reduction in a degrowth scenario, but there might also a bit of be of work increase because we're shifting to a, an alternative source of energy. So in fact, if I'm understanding correctly, just to rephrase, you're saying that indeed a degrowth society or, or social order doesn't mean that there is no there is no jobs, there is no work. Actually, if we take uh, sectors like care, health, education, art, culture, all activities of social reproduction, there are activities that require real people and not machines to be performed. So in practice, we could also imagine a situation in which we, did, we do need, need more people and maybe different or less machines to uh, generate wealth. It's, yeah, it's hard to forecast. Hmm. It's hard to forecast whether um, there will be less work or the same amount of work or even more work. But should there be less work, then the response to that would be redistributing the work that there isn't just going for a shorter work week combined with a UBI. So in both cases, it's not, not necessarily a problem. Thank you. Uh, there was a question about capitalism. There is always a question about capitalism when we talk about degrowth, because indeed uh, it's a word that it's tricky. Is it compatible with capitalism, degrowth, or a movement of degrowth? Does it have to, does, has to overthrow capitalism, or there is a, another way? <laughs> Yes, I think the short answer is, is no, it's not necessarily compatible with capitalism. What we need to talk about, however, is what we mean when we say capitalism. So sometimes when people talk about capitalism, they mean something rather benign, just the fact that, that there is markets and people are trading something on those markets or exchanging goods and services on the market. And I think that is something that is very compatible with a degrowth scenario. It's, with a degrowth scenario. What is less compatible is the idea of capitalism. That you need to constantly make a profit and compete on the market. So reinvest your profit into, into further sort of productive capacities and therefore grow all the time. So capitalism, I would define it as a system that always needs to grow in order to be stable. Hmm. And that is not compatible with the degrowth scenario. Now, we might also go into further detail in saying that capitalism is, of course, also a class system that in order to make a profit needs to basically exploit labor force, needs to exploit e ecosystems. Otherwise, there is not the profit margin. So all of that is, of course, not in line with degrowth ideas of justice. Hmm. Um, so if we put it like that, then capitalism is not compatible with degrowth. Whether it's always smart to, to wave the anti-capitalist flag when we're trying to lobby for degrowth is another question. I think that depends on context. Hmm. Yeah, there is another question that actually came uh, up already in the first of these um, meetings two weeks ago, but I will reiterate it. Um, what does it mean degrowth for uh, developing countries or countries of late industrialization, let's put it this way? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's, it's always a difficult one for me, and I like to always refer to, to my 
colleagues or fellow advocates in the degrowth community who are in development studies who are a little bit better than I am in answering that question. Um, but the first thing that I usually like to point out in that context is that degrowth is not an alternative development agenda that then gets reimposed from, I don't know, west to the rest or from global north to global south or however you want to name it. So it's, it shouldn't be that. I think that, that's very important. And um, I would say what is very important or that the need to degrowth is particularly imperative now for rich nations uh, or the nations of early industrializations. Those are the ones who are overshooting planetary boundaries. Those are the nations who basically, if everyone would live like that, we would consume three planets every year. So those are really those who, for ecological reasons, need to degrow and would therefore also make certain resources available for those who might still, you know, live um, in a way that they do not meet material needs. Um, and there are certainly global contexts where also a certain growth is, is probably needed in order to meet basic material needs. Now, the question that you could, of course, ask themselves, do they then need growth or do they need to satisfy their material needs? So do we need to you know, talk about degrowth as a proxy for that? Or can we rather talk about them achieving those things right away directly? And I think a very... Uh, image that became very prominent in this context is, of course, Kate Raworth's idea of the donut, right? Where you have sort of in and outer boundaries, outer boundaries, which should not be overshot. That, so that's relevant for those countries who are already rich and are consuming too much, but then also basic material or basic needs that should also be reached by everyone. And uh, I should mention that Deagle is very much a sort of justice agenda that tries to make that possible. Thank you. And this leads me to there is a question about circular economy. Um, maybe you're not, maybe it's not your field, but maybe you, you can answer it. So um, uh, one of the listener asks, um, would it be um, possible, basically? Uh, oh, so would be would the grow be necessary in a situation in which a territory manages to be completely circular or like to have a circular economy in place? Mm. Yes. Um, so we need to be a bit careful, I think, with this cir circular economy paradigm, because um, circular economy um, might just be a new green growth, <laughs> um, green growth paradigm, right? The idea is sort of that you reuse your waste, um, but you don't necessarily reduce it. And uh, I think in that sense, circular economy might not be enough, but having an economy that basically does not increase its material use and does not uh yeah they also increase its waste products also by by living sufficiently that would be of course also a degrowth thing so the circular economy it can go with a deep growth agenda but it can also go without it and as i see it being employed at the moment quite oftenly uh, quite often means actually that it's rather a green growth thing to the extent that sometimes when you implement a circular economy you actually need more waste even to make it happen because you need that waste in order to basically um yeah produce new resources that are then used for for production so uh, we need to be a bit careful there yeah um we have still one minute but i would advise that we go on for five minutes more just five minutes so if people People can always re-listen um, and re-watch this video on YouTube, of course. Um, the first uh, is about uh, one of the things that you touched in your presentation, minimalist living. Can mm -hmm. you expand a bit more about that? It seems interesting because it's not only about being in a movement, but it's also about choices of individuals. So uh, it seems to touch upon also individual responsibility. So how do you, what is the use of that word or that field of research that you're doing for a degrowth um, transition? Yes, yeah, thanks for asking about my research. Um, so yeah, minimalism is, is a trend in lifestyle culture. And, uh, I use it, the term very broadly. So when I refer to minimalists, I'm talking about people 
um, who are on the one hand complaining that we're currently living in a world of too much and that might be too much clutter, which needs to then be decluttered, but it might also be too much work, too much busyness, feeling stressed, and also too much distraction in the context of the, the um, attention economy. And what most minimalists agree on is that, um, yeah, having less of all of that, less, less consumption and therefore also less clutter, um, less, let's say, engagement in the attention economy by, for instance, disconnecting and going on a digital detox, for example, or even working less, which can, for some people of privilege, be made possible by also consuming less, uh, makes them more well. So a lot of minimalists don't really start to be minimalist because they have an ecological agenda in any way, but only because they really argue for themselves that it makes them better, which you know, for me, it's an interesting thing, because on the one hand, the fact that they conceive of it as an individual well-being project makes them very credible. Um, it means that the actual benefits that they associate with their minimalism aren't just, you know, some benefits that they claim are benefits because they have a sort of environmental agenda in the back of their minds. But on the other hand, it makes it also problematic because for them, it's really just a thing of individual choice. And that means that as I have previously added, it always remains tied to a certain privilege. So some people can practice minimalism because it's not enforced upon them. Other people who have to, you know, work seven days a week already in order to make ends meet, you know, they can consume as little as they like. They still have to work so much because apparently their income is so small that, that already with a minimal consumption, they can only make ends meet this way. Um, and that's why we need broader policy changes and minimalism cannot be enough. Um, however, I think that it might be an interesting cultural current that from a sort of degrowth perspective, from the perspective of maybe a degrowth movement, could potentially be mobilized in order to go for a sort of certain degrowth demands, hmm. could maybe be politicized. And that is something that I'm trying to research how to do that and also why it hasn't currently happened. Because in, in the initial analysis of, you know, too much leading to, you know, not so much well-being, <laughs> Um, they're very close in a way also to the dealer of community, but then they are really conceiving of it as a very individual thing and sometimes also replicating certain forms of neoliberal ideology of you know, self-optimization and mm. um, market-driven healing of everything and, and so on and so forth. So there are certain aspects that, that are completely going within the contemporary sort of hegemony and then there are other might be used to propose an alternative. Long answer, sorry. No, no, it's, it's extremely interesting because I think just to give a perspective, I think this is also the the, the trick of uh, the narrative trick that may be able to capture the interest of the middle classes for the climate uh, uh, for the climate uh, um, uh, crisis. So saying, you know, it's not only about biodiversity and it's not only about our whole ecosystem, all that makes us. Uh, uh, alive in this in this world, but it's also about your personal daily life. It's also about your your uh, the way you look at yourself every day, the way you uh, deal with your daily challenges, and uh, how you feel, and and your well being in general. So I think it's also a narrative addition to the to the uh, story of a, of a, uh, <laughs> let's say meeting climate targets. Uh, it makes it more tangible. Just one last comment that is on the chat, but. You already answered for it, but I would use it as a closing statement. Somebody asked, do you basically uh, uh, recommend the climate movement to embrace degrowth more and to actively promote it? That's what you're, you're claiming? <laughs> um, see, I, I think I, I would... I think it would be quite arrogant if I would tell the climate movement what they need to embrace and what not. I think um, it makes sense for different different movements within even that climate movement to go with different strategies and different tactics and have also different narratives at hand, depending on the target groups that they want to convince and bring to do certain things. Um, but I do think that it makes sense to have degrowth as a sort of yeah vision of an alternative future and also of an analysis of what is wrong with the current paradigm of producing well-being in the back of our minds for that very good thank you uh, very much uh, thank you to miriam Meiser from the university of uh, uh, maastricht thank you all for listening to this second uh, event we will have uh, 
Of course, as I said, the third one in two weeks. Please keep an eye on the time of that event because we will connect with somebody that is based in Australia. So it will be earlier uh, in the day. So keep an eye on the page. I thank you again, uh, Miriam, for uh, your time and your and your presentation today. Thank and you. I invite everybody to uh, watch again this uh, session on the YouTube channel. And thank you, Leo, for the technical assistance. And have a good evening, everybody. Bye.